uh, with uh, prisonorfreedom.com. And uh, I'm broadcasting uh, from uh, 30,000 feet in the air on American Airlines Flight uh, 1054. And with me, uh, next to me here, uh, my passenger right here uh, on the same seat here is uh, David. He's a school teacher. And uh, we were talking about Bitcoins, and he asked me to explain to him what is Bitcoin. So in this video, I want to give a uh, non-technical explanation of what Bitcoin, the platform, the currency, and how it works, the why, the how, the what, the when, and everything, all right? And um, thanks to American Airlines, um, they're sponsoring us with the uh, ginger ale, okay? So, um, first of all, um, just uh, da uh, say hello, David. How you doing? All right. Okay, so David um, first heard about Bitcoins a, a, a few weeks ago, and um, he wanted to, uh, he got online, did some research on it, and uh, was still confused about it, right? So let me go ahead and explain it to him. Bitcoin is a public ledger. It's a platform. It's a, it's a public ledger, accounting ledger. It's a platform and a network, okay? okay. Uh, you can describe it in any of those manners, right? Now... The easiest way to understand platform, I mean, uh, Bitcoin, is think of it as a highway system, and like a highway system or uh, in your country, and that highway system is called Bitcoin. Okay. The vehicles that travel, uh, I mean, the, the rules, the laws, and the regulations that govern how things travel through that highway network is also called Bitcoin. Okay. The actual vehicles themselves that travel through that highway are also called Bitcoin. Okay. okay, so there's the first confusion. Yep. Is that so now we understand that Bitcoin is a network. Yeah. Okay? And the things that go through there are called Bitcoin awesome. and the rules that govern how things travel through there are also called Bitcoin. Right. Do you have a question? <clears throat> okay. So that that help you so far? So so far it's a good idea. Okay, so the the objects, the, the the vehicles that travel through that network, that yes. highway system, yeah. um, right now is being used as a currency. Yeah. Okay. Right. And what is a currency? A currency is anything that people decide to use as a um, uh, as to exchange value. So right. throughout history, we know that gold has yeah. been the main, the primary. Uh, 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 um, a vehicle of exchange, a value exchange, okay. right? So I give you an ounce of gold and you give me something in exchange for it, yeah. right? Any questions so far? Any confusion so far? Um, no, I think I think it's still not totally clear. Um, no, well, let me keep listening. Okay. Keep going. So uh, probably the first question that comes to your mind is that why did someone create this Bitcoin network or this highway system, right? No, I think, I mean, I think I understand there's some attraction to um, a non-governmental, non-regulated... Universal? Form, yeah, kind of universal form okay. of currency. I, um, if, that's, if that's the intent, I understand why that would be okay. uh, of interest to, to people. Okay, so the, the, the question that probably comes to your mind is why are these vehicles that travel through these networks that's being, you know, being used as a currency, yeah. and what is so special about these vehicles that people would want to use it as a currency? Would, would, would that, like, why not just use gold or the U.S. dollar or yeah. the euro or, you know? I mean, that's one of the big questions. Um, I think the second big question is I still, let's say, um, let's say I want to buy, um, I don't know, an iPhone. Okay. Um, could I buy an iPhone using Bitcoins and how? And how would I, you know, how would that work and how would I feel secure that I'm getting value for my, my Bitcoins? Okay, so the, the, the question that you're asking is, um, um, where can I, the iPhone example is very good. Right now, you can buy almost any electronic gadget or, or, or hardware or software. You can pretty much buy this plane ticket with Bitcoin. Okay. All you have to do is go online and search for a business that accepts Bitcoin. We apologize, we're out of the turkey we, uh, you just search online, yeah. and there is also a Bitcoin directory that lists 
businesses that accept Bitcoin. Okay. So just like you have a business that accepts Visa or MasterCard or anything like that, yeah, yeah. or they accept the US dollar or the Euro or the Mexican yeah. peso, yeah. then you just find that business that accepts it yeah. and they will give you the phone. Purchase. And okay. it's not a gimmick, it's not a scam. Uh, if they say that on their website they accept Bitcoin and they also have Visa MasterCard, like for example, like overstock.com yeah. accepts Bitcoin. Okay. So you can go there and buy your phones and stuff on there. Okay. That's helpful. So then my next question is, um, so I understand um, I work, I earn a paycheck, I, I, I have Okay, is your, is, is, your bit, is your paycheck right now in uh, U.S. Dollars. dollars? It's in dollars. I save up my money and I uh, go to buy the iPhone in dollars. I know exactly where my money came from. Mm -hmm. I know exactly where it's going. Okay. This is what I don't understand with Bitcoin. I have no idea how, like, wh how do I get the money to purchase um, my iPhone with Bitcoin? Um, and where does it, I guess it goes to the business um, if I've purchased it from the business. But but I think that part, how do, where is where does this money live? Come from. Yeah, where, yeah, okay, where who mints who where? mints the money? Uh, yeah, well, that's a that's a piece of it. Okay. Uh, so the the, the the highway system the, 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 uh, uh, is also referred to in the Bitcoin world. Yeah. It's referred to as a public ledger. Yeah. It's an accounting ledger, and that accounting ledger uh, technically is called a blockchain. But you don't what? need a blockchain. Okay. Okay. Ledger? And yeah. Le so can I this ledger was invented by a computer scientist yeah. and a cryptographer named Satoshi Nakamoto. Okay, right. Right? I remember reading about this. Right. So the term ledger to me, and maybe it's, maybe I don't have the term right, it implies a zero sum. It implies it's, it's always going to equal out eventually. Exactly. This ledger right now, whenever you get paid, uh, your paycheck is in U.S. dollars, um, it's stored at the bank. Yeah. So let's say, uh, what bank do you use? Bank of America? Uh, uh, whatever, okay? Yeah. Yeah. So let's say you, you have it at Bank of America. Yeah they have a ledger that accounts for all, how much money you have in there. Yeah. So if you were to send me some money, they would update that ledger. Yeah. If I send you some money, they would update that ledger. Yeah. So in the Bitcoin world, the Bitcoin ledger is being kept and managed by the entire community. Uh -huh. In other words, there is no centralized bank, there's no centralized computer, there's no centralized individual, there's no centralized organization yeah. that maintains that ledger. Yeah. When Satoshi Nakamoto invented this ledger, he released it to the wild, to the public, and he said that anyone can come in and help to manage that ledger. Mm -hmm. And so whenever you send a, trans a Bitcoin to me, it has to be updated in the ledger. Yes. So. There are millions of people out there using the ledger right now. So they volunteer their computers to update the ledger. Okay. So instead of having Bank of America update the ledger, yeah. you know, if you want to, you can volunteer your computer to update the ledger. And what, it, what does it mean to volunteer my computer? What it, if I volunteered my computer, it's a little bit of storage or something? What, what am I volunteering? Mm -hmm. You are volunteering your CPU and your graphics, uh, your processing power. Okay. okay. So right now, when you transfer me a U.S. dollar, uh, Bank of America uses their servers yeah. to process the transaction. Correct. Yeah. All right. So when you send me a Bitcoin, the process, the transaction is being processed by the entire network, network the entire Bitcoin community, and this is what technically is called a peer-to-peer -peer network okay. because everyone can volunteer their computers to help process the transactions. As long as you're online, it requires an internet connection, obviously. Yes. But that's okay. it. Okay. Okay. Now, obviously, there has to be an... Ins Why would you volunteer your computer for? It? Right. Right? So there's, you know, people that are investing and spending millions of dollars in computer hardware to help volunteer to process everyone's Bitcoin transaction. Mm -hmm. So like if I send you a Bitcoin right now or you send me a Bitcoin, it has to be updated in the ledger and it has to be secured so that my Bitcoins actually go to your account right. and it doesn't go to someone else's account. Yeah. Agree? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah. The, the reward 
for volunteering your computer to process these Bitcoin transactions. Yeah. When Satoshi Nakamoto invented the network, right, the platform, he wanted people to help volunteer to work. There was two problems. How do you get the public to volunteer okay. their yeah. computers to process the Bitcoin transactions? Yeah. And how do you mint new currency? Yeah. Because if Satoshi just out of nowhere minted 21 million Bitcoins, uh, people would say that's not fair. Like, right. Because now you're like the, uh, the Federal Reserve. You just minted all the money right. and it's not fair to us. So to create a fair system and to incentivize people to volunteer their computers yep. to process all these Bitcoin transactions that people are creating, yep. um, he offered a reward. And this, yeah, in the form of bitcoins. Okay. So you get rewarded fifty bitcoins if you're willing to process all these transactions. If you, every ten minutes a new block of transactions is compiled, yeah. right? So whatever all the transactions in the last ten minutes, uh, it's more than ten minutes, but just for simplicity yeah. uh, reasons, uh, explanatory reasons, we'll just say that it's. 10, 10 minutes, okay? So all the Bitcoin transactions that happen around the world in the last 10 minutes, it's compressed together. Yeah. It's um, If you volunteer your computer to, to, to process all those Bitcoin transactions and then compress it and then encrypt it so that it, it's correct and then you send it out to the network and every other computer out there on the network um, gets, updated. gets updated and they look at it and they go and they verify to make sure that it's correct. So, um, what I'm volunteering is is literally just CPU space. Yes. Uh, not not time. There's nothing I actually have to do. No. no. The, the the Bitcoin software does it by itself. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and so what happens is after you process that data, that block of information from the last ten minutes of transactions, yep. and you you submit it to the network and all the other computers in the network are going to jump on it to verify to make sure it's correct. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, uh, I'm not a computer scientist, but the way that it was explained to me is that basically if you, it's like finding a square root. If you ask me, Ty, what's the square root of five? I say that it's, you know, two point something, right? Whatever it is, it's going to take me a while. But once I find the answer to it and I give it to you, it only takes you a quick second to verify that it's correct. Right. You agree? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So that's how it gets verified immediately. And if you're the first one to process all those transactions and you're the first one to encrypt it and yeah. it's, everything is correct and everything is legit, yeah. right? And you submit it to the network and they, they, they review it and they double check it to make sure it's correct, then you get rewarded 50 Bitcoins for it. But, but it's random. Okay. So you're, you're, let's say your son right there, his computer is doing the same thing, yeah. and if, if he submits it, it's yeah. first come, first serve, and it's random. Based on how much CPU space I'm... It's, it's based on whoever gets it, the, the transactions done first and correct uh -huh. and encrypted. And how do, you, how do you verify that it's correct and encrypted? The software does it all automatically. So how do... You may, your explanation makes it sound like I have some control... I get that it's random that it comes to you, me. You don't have control because what happens is once the software is installed on your computer, it processes the transaction, it submits it, and it's like a lottery system. It's like submitting a lottery ticket, yes. and then whoever gets it. So everyone's computers. So at some point, basically, if I'm on the Bitcoin network, yeah, if my computer's on the Bitcoin network, at yeah. some point, I'm going to end up with... Um, some extra bitcoins in my wallet. Yes. Yes. Just it, by it, virtue of having been on there. Yes. And if you get it corrected. But here's the, here's a caveat, though. Yeah. If a million people start processing these transactions, guess what happens? My chances go down. Your chances go down. So the difficulty level gets really, really hard. Right. And the reason why they did it like that, that Satoshi made it like that, is so that someone doesn't come in and try to game the system try to overrun the system by, by, by taking uh, having, control of over 50% of the network. Having lots of uh, CPUs, just... Exactly. Just, uh, I see. Uh -huh. Right? So it's a security issue, yep. right? And 
when you submit those transactions, there's no guarantee that you're going to get the 50 Bitcoin reward. And so, and, and so that at, uh, um, so when Satoshi designed the Bitcoin network, he designed it so that the reward gets cut in half every four years. So when Bitcoin was invented in 2009 and released in yeah. January of 2009, in 2013, it, the reward got cut in half from 50 Bitcoin reward to 25 Bitcoins. And this is based on some assumption of growth? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. So um, there will only be a total of 21 mi million Bitcoins ever created. Okay. So, and then are there also, like... Could I take my paycheck and and convert it all from dollars to bitcoins? Yes, and vice versa. What what but you would have to do? Not, it, I'm still not adding bitcoins. I'm taking from the from existing yes. up to 21 million bitcoins. bitcoins. And right now, the after the first uh, five years that bitcoin has been uh, available to the public, there has been about 13 million bitcoins that has been minted. Um, let me okay. Thank you. Um, so, about 13, over half. yeah, over half, and all 21 million Bitcoins will be minted by the year 2140, according to the Bitcoin algorithm, uh, okay. according to the Bitcoin software and the math. 2140? How is it that in four years, five years, they've done over half? Why is it slowed down? Uh, because every four years, oh, it gets cut in half. In half. Right. So, okay. in yeah. the year 2007, yeah. uh, 17. It will get cut down to 12 and a half bitcoins and so on. So if there are more, theoretically then, if there are more and more users, the value of each bitcoin, grow, the relative value of each bitcoin grows. Yes, exactly. That's why when uh, China, in 2013, when the Chinese uh, population uh, found out about bitcoin and they jumped on it, that's why the value of bitcoin went from $13 to over uh, $1,200. You mean the uh, effect of the exchange rate? Yes, the exchange rate. Okay. So let me answer that question you asked about getting paid in Bitcoins and, and getting converted to Bitcoins. Um, what happens is if you work for a company or an organization or an individual that is willing to pay you in Bitcoins, then you get accepted in Bitcoins. So, for example, let's say that if you were going to teach me some math yep. and, and, and you said that you were willing to accept Bitcoins and I have some Bitcoins to pay you, well, then obviously you can use those Bitcoins and not have to convert it right. to U.S. dollars or to the uh, Euro. Yep. Um, as long as you use it with someone else that is willing to accept Bitcoins. Right. right. And how... Um, okay, this is helpful. I'm starting to understand it. Okay, so right now, let's say that you want to get your first Bitcoin. Yep. There's several ways to get that. Um, the easiest way um, is obviously if I just you open up your phone right now and I just send you some Bitcoin, yeah. obviously. And that'll take less than yeah, however right. long it takes me to type in your address. Why would you do that? Um, just, no, I, I'm, uh, no, no, just... I, I would, mean, why would one do that? Um, I, I would do that. Um, I would do that. Uh, I would send you a fraction. I would send you a fraction of a Bitcoin yeah. just so you can see how fast the transaction yeah. is and how easy it is yeah. and how you don't need no ID. You don't have yeah. to, you know... Uh, I just want you to see the ease of it. Obviously, we're on the airplane right now, no internet connection, yeah, yeah. so I'm not able to no, do no, it. I get it. But, uh, I usually do that, but let's say that if you 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 agree to tutor me in math yes. and, and I agree to pay you yep. uh, X oh, amount for, for your time, okay. then I would send you the bitcoins with my phone Got on it. my computer also. Yeah. And I don't need to go through no bank, and you yeah. don't need to go through no bank either. Yeah, okay, I get so, it. Okay. Does, does that help make sense, more yeah. sense now? Yeah, absolutely. So... Um, the reason why only 21 min million bitcoins will ever be created yeah. is because um, he Satoshi, uh, the the inventor of Bitcoin, did some research, and there was something with how many uh, uh, digits that you can store on a computer and easy for oh. people to type in something like that. I read it somewhere, yeah. but I don't understand the full math. But yeah. there's a technical reason why it's there. So it's not just a random or arbitrary number that he pulled out of, out of left field somewhere, yeah. right? Now, you have some a lot of new copycat coins that created different numbers, like a billion coins yeah. for their new currency or whatever, or a trillion coins, but that's just a random... That's, they, they just made that an even number. 21 million was technically and specifically researched 
and created for a reason so that in case our technology evolves, yeah. right? So the way that I would send you, like right now, one Bitcoin is worth around $500 as we're speaking. Okay. If I wanted to send you a dollar, then I would send you a fraction, the yeah. proportional fraction of that Bitcoin yeah. that equals a dollar. Yeah. And that's how I would pay you. Yeah, I get it. So, so what in, was I right that there are now Bitcoin ATMs? Yes. So um, in addition to me giving you a Bitcoin or yeah. paying you with my Bitcoins, yeah. um, you can also go to an exchange to exchange your US dollars or your euros for a Bitcoin. And now, like you mentioned, they have ATMs available to where you can go there and put in US dollars oh, or put in the euro yeah. and then take out Bitcoins. And, and taking it out means I scan my bit wallet and it gets put in because there's no, there's nothing yeah. physical. No, um, all the Bitcoins are digital. Yeah. And if you want to, you can print it on a piece of paper and have it in physical form. Oh, but okay. uh, it's all digital right now. Just like over 90% of the US dollar and the yeah. euro are digital. And if you want, you can get some that are printed. Yeah. You can go to the bank and get some that are printed on a piece of paper yeah. that are you know, referred to as a US dollar. And Bitcoin can be done the same way also. Okay. Interesting. And what about, so are people using this as, a, as um, an investment vehicle? Um, there are several ways. Are you talking, are you using it in your coaching? Um, no, um, uh, uh, hold on real quick here. Hold on one second. <laughs> I'm curious, I think I understand now how it works, very helpful. Um, I'm, now I'm curious about sort of the operation and the organization so there's software, obviously, that involves finances and security. So it, it's got to be a fairly robust operation. Yes. And then there's also somebody doing currency exchanges. Okay, so the, the thing is this, okay? Um, Bitcoin is the network and the currency and is a platform that you can use to transact, finan make trans uh, financial transactions, right? Um, the software is being updated by volunteers. And when Satoshi Nakamoto, when he first, uh, the first couple of years, he, he contributed and wrote the software himself with volunteers helping because it's an open source software so anyone can download the software, review it for bugs, security, and things like that, and offer uh, uh, recommendations and code to patch the software to upgrade it and to make it better. Okay. So there is a team of, of people that, that develop the software, right? However, anyone can do it. And, and what that team is, the, that team uh, is, uh, was formerly uh, by a person named Gavin Andreessen. He is the chief scientist, computer scientist for the Bitcoin Foundation. Okay. And the foundation is, is an organization that is set up to promote Bitcoins and to educate people on Bitcoin, all right? So um, what Satoshi did was that he looked at all the people that was helping him that volunteered their work and their effort to develop the Bitcoin software and the code and contribute their time and energy and effort, right? And over the years, he saw that Gavin Andreessen was a very uh, a capable person. He was a very good coder, computer scientist, and understand cryptography and everything like that and computer security so he gave basically he handed the torch over to Gavin and Gavin was willing to be public um, he was willing to be public and he's out of I think like San Francisco I think okay. or Boston it's one of those two cities okay. I think he might even be in Boston <clears throat> but he was left in charge of being quote unquote the lead developer or the lead programmer for Bitcoin, okay? And what happened was um, just recently, just a couple of weeks ago, like two or three weeks ago, he announced that he would step down from that role. And he had the role of the lead developer for, I think, uh, since 2010 um, when, um, when uh, Satoshi left the Bitcoin project and he did not want to be, no one knows who he is, no one knows what he looks like. No one knows um, 
what he sounds like or seen pictures of him or nothing, okay? And the, the name Satoshi Nakamoto is actually just a pseudonym that he used. So he's a very private person and does not want to be in the public eyes. And so when he released this code, um, he wanted people to focus the attention on the technology that he had invented, which is the public ledger technology, okay. instead of focusing on him. Right. So he wanted the merit of his software and his technology to benefit humanity right. and not let people determine the value of Bitcoin uh, based on him. Yep. So he has chosen to remain anonymous from 2009 and then when he handed the, 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 uh, the role of lead developer over to Gavin Andreessen, um, he has disappeared since then. So no one knows how to get in touch with him, no one has been able to get in touch with him, contact him or nothing. So. Yeah. So, you know, anybody in the news right now or in the media that claims that they know who he is or they've gotten in touch with him is all bogus or all bogus. And they're just all phony. Even the article by Newsweek, that's just bogus. Um, everybody just laughed at that in the Bitcoin community. I didn't see it. Yeah. So, the, the only way that people, there's two ways that people would know that it's the real Satoshi Nakamoto because in the beginning when he first created the Bitcoin network and the platform, he was the main guy processing everyone's transactions. His computer was. So he set up a bunch of computers to process everyone's transactions until new volunteers came into the network to volunteer their computer. So because of that, in the first few months that he volunteered his computer to process the transactions for everyone, he was rewarded 50 bitcoins every 10 minutes, basically. So right now, he has more Bitcoins than anybody else in the Bitcoin uh, world. Okay. So he has over a million Bitcoins. So when Bitcoin was worth over $1,000, he was a billionaire. Okay. Right? Now, everybody complains. Uh, you know, some people might say that, you know, that that's not fair, that he has all that. But keep in mind that he was the inventor of Bitcoin and he was willing to volunteer his computers to process everyone's transactions. And then all the early adopters, they are all millionaires now. Right. The, simply because um, they got were, early. yeah, they got yeah. in early and they were able to take, to volunteer their computers and take the time to secure the network. Because right. keep in mind, not only are you volunteering your computer to, um, to, uh, to process the Bitcoin transactions for the users, but you're also securing the network to make sure that the users, right, don't get hacked or anything like that, right? right? Yeah. The, the, the Bitcoin, not the user's computer, but yeah. the Bitcoin network. Right. So, I get it. Okay. That's helpful. And so, the whenever you hear that the exchanges are getting hacked, keep in mind that the exchanges are a business. So that would be similar to saying that Bank of America branch got robbed. Right by a bank robber, but just because Bank of America gets robbed at one of their branches, does that mean that so the U.S. dollar difference. is yeah. collapsed? No, I get it. Right. I get it. Makes sense. Okay, so so that's the same thing. So the biggest collapse and the biggest exchange to collapse was a, an exchange called Mount Gox in Japan, and they were the biggest and the oldest exchange, yeah. and when they collapsed, um, they lost a lot of money, people's money. Um, and, and the reason for that was because Ladies they... Ladies and gentlemen, um, as soon as we get the aisle clear, we'll come through with our second beverage service. Well, the, the reason why they, they lost uh, a lot of people's customers' Bitcoins was because they, they were told by the Bitcoin Foundation and other computer scientists and security specialists that their, their system was not good, was not secure, and they needed to connect to the Bitcoin network. So what they did was they disconnected their computers and their system from the Bitcoin network uh, and so other people couldn't volunteer to process the transactions for them. And the reason why they did that was to increase the speed of transactions, the speed of the trades. And then after the transactions and the customers' trades were done, then they would reconnect to the network to, to uh, broadcast out to the network what had just happened. Well, during the time that they were disconnected from the network, um, they got hacked by uh, computer hackers trying to steal their bitcoins. So, when they connected back, they found out that there was a discrepancy or a difference in what their ledger shows and what the public bitcoin ledger shows. So that's how they discovered, and that's what happened. And it's no one's fault but their own, because they were told over and over since 2011 
that this was an issue. Right. Got it. Okay. So does, does that make sense? Yeah, that yeah. It's not. It's not the Bitcoin community's fault. It's not the Bitcoin network's fault. It's not the volunteers who who process all the Bitcoin transactions. Yep. It's not n nobody's fault except for the owner of the Mount Gox exchange. Yeah. I get it. So I need to go up that. Yeah. All right. So uh, thanks for joining us uh, today, guys. And I know this is kind of uh, interesting to broadcast from 30,000 feet in the air in an American Airlines uh, plane. But um, I appreciate you guys joining with me, and uh, I hope that this broadcast, if you're watching this and you're new to Bitcoin, that the uh, conversation I had with David will also help you to better understand Bitcoin. If uh, you want to support our uh, site and our channel and our efforts, uh, you are welcome to make a Bitcoin donation, and uh, I will use it to, um, to, uh, to help other people understand Bitcoin. If you want to donate uh, any other altcoins, I will be happy to accept it and, and use it as to help other people uh, to understand the altcoin uh, uh, in question also. Uh, thanks for joining us, guys, and I uh, look forward to doing future broadcasts again from 30,000 feet in the air. This may be the first uh, uh, Bitcoin uh, broadcast from, uh, uh, from uh, 30,000 feet in the air. So uh, if someone else has it, please let me know, and I'd love to check it out. Thanks, guys.